cover, so we would have absolutely no hope whatsoever. Just uh, another word, I know Tim said maybe a little bit about the ministry retreat, but let me just say uh, absolutely fabtabulous, I can't even think of a word that describes just how, how good it was, amen? amen? It was such a supernatural time that, uh, you know, you just, you have these moments where you, you participate in something and God just moves in such an incredible way, you just really can't put it into words. I won't rub it in your face, those of you who didn't go, but boy, I hope somebody else does, all right? <laughs> because it was that phenomenal. That it was just a real encounter with a holy God during that time. And this is the age that we need to see those kind of encounters, amen? So God moved in, did, did marvelous things. I will say, on behalf of all those who worked so hard to put that together, from Tim to the men's ministry and all those involved with it, uh, in talking with... Uh, Brother Jeffries, after, Neil Jeffries, after the conference, he came up to me and put his arm around me. He said, listen, he says, I do a lot of these conferences. And he does. He's at men's conferences all over the country just because being a star athlete and all those things. So I, I, I do a lot of these conferences all over the country. He said, but nobody does these conferences any better than Believer's Fellowship. Amen. Amen. That's, so, uh, and I believe that's true with all the conferences that we participate from our, our ladies conference, which is coming up very soon. Those brochures are out there on the tables, ladies, to our men's, to our marriage retreats. There's a lot of prayer and a great, great deal of prayer and preparation that go into these. And uh, they're always very strategic and they're always very timely. So when you see the church having a conference or revival or uh, a retreat or anything like that, it's not just because we put stuff on the calendar, it's time to do something. It's because we believe that God uh, wants us to do these particular ministries. And so when we do them, we do them with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, all our body, and all our strength. And with all the prayer, the preparation, the praying that goes into it, you're just crazy if you don't go be a part of one. Yeah. On. Amen. Because <laughs> they're that good and they're that life transforming. Can you hear me? <laughs> Wake up. Goodness gracious. Remind you of ground rule number two. Don't be dead. Amen. Ground rule number one is Jesus is always Lord. Praise God and the Lamb. But it was a great, great time of the Lord. And there really was some, some supernatural things that God did, did in people's hearts and lives. But we've been talking about those things. And I don't know. How many today just say, I need a miracle? I mean, seriously, I need a miracle. I do. I, I know that some of you do. But I've got some good news for you. I know somebody who is in the miracle business. And after 104 years of doing this, I can bear sound witness and testimony that God is not dead. He's not on vacation. He's not asleep. He is still on the throne and still moving in the hearts and the lives of people. And this message today on the miracles of Jesus, I think, has a couple of important principles within it that talk about, you know, seeing God move in our life and how God does work in our life in incredible ways. All these miracles, as we've said each week, are really, in fact, the actual translation for the word miracle is the word sign. And every one of these miracles, they are signs. They're like massive billboards declaring something. And what they're declaring is, and, and more importantly than just that God can do a miracle, it's, it's a declaration that Jesus is in the midst of the people, that he is God in the flesh, that he is the Christ, the Messiah, the one they've been looking for. All these miracles were to wake up the children of Israel to see the Messiah was present, that God was on him and God was in him and he is God himself. And so often they just missed the moment and kind of looked at it and said, what can I get from God? What can God do for me? But that's pretty much where we are today, is it not? What, what can I get from, what, what can you do for me? And it's not like we're going to do anything, but we get all bent out of shape and God doesn't do something for us. God forbid that we might have to accidentally do something for him. Amen. Oh, I see. The devil didn't like that, did he? You ought to just plug those lights back in. It'll be all right. All right. If you'll move your head back there, then uh, there you go. Praise the Lord. Y'all go ahead and say Amen. 
But all these, these things are just signs and declaration of the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this particular miracle, as we're looking at them today, this is the fifth in our series. And we're talking about, you know, the miracle of the, uh, where the well, somehow I just didn't hit the title, but it's, it's the centurion. Uh, when he comes to the Lord, he's a Roman guard and he comes to the Lord and he's asking for his servant to be healed. So as you look in Matthew chapter five, chapter eight, verse five, you'll see that this story, but it's also mentioned in Luke chapter seven. And you can, we'll kind of bring those two together so you can see just what the whole history of this thing is. But it says, And when Jesus entered Capernaum, a servant came to him, imploring him and saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, fearfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go. And he goes. Say to another, come. And he comes. Say to my slave, do this. And, and he does it. And when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said, those who were following, truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in all of Israel. And I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping, gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, go and it shall be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed that very moment. Now, there's some people who take these miracles of Jesus and they, you know, they, they want to put Jesus in a box and say he's going to perform a certain way in every situation and every occasion. But, you know, don't, don't get stuck there. And they, they, they like to use this, well, as their faith has said, so it will be unto you. And that's where you get these preachers who, if you ever have a crisis in your life or a trauma or, or you know, or, or sickness or death, it's kind of like, well, you don't have enough faith. And since you don't have enough faith, you know, then God's not going to do anything. And so a lot of people live in condemnation because something didn't happen in regard to their own personal request to the Lord, like God had somehow uh, just didn't count them faithful enough. Listen, everything that God does really comes back to the sovereignty of God. And, and I want to talk about that in just a moment and to the fact that he is the Lord. He's in charge. He knows all things. He sees all things. He knows what is needed in your life. And he knows the moment in which it needs to be done. He doesn't overlook a one of us. He's not failing in any regard. He's God, sovereign God, and holy God. But I want to look just for a moment at this particular centurion. And look at this guy's character. In Luke 7, it also talks about him. And in Luke 7, you have the, the, the scribes and the, and the rabbis coming out to talk to Jesus. And, and they make this statement, that, hey, this guy's worthy for you to grant this to him. For he loves our nation. And it was he who built our synagogue. Now, this isn't your average Roman soldier. Remember the Romans, you know, the, they could be quite brutal and, and their soldiers were the top trained soldiers in the world, you know, and, and you look at these centurions, they were men who were in authority. They had hundreds of men under them and no less than 100 have complete rule over them to give them direction. And this guy was not like so many other Roman soldiers which are described as brutal, selfish, inconsiderate treating people like animals. This guy is unique. In fact, if you look at centurions in the New Testament, you, you know, they, they really don't fit the rest of our mindset for the Romans you know, and, and those Roman brutal, savage kind of warriors that they were. These centurions, in fact, at least the ones that are mentioned in the New Testament, about every one of them come to faith in Jesus Christ. You remember the one in Acts chapter 10. Every one of them come to the place of putting their faith and their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, you know, don't get all of them locked up in the same little group when you think about the brutality of the Roman legion and the Roman guard. Now, obviously, this man had sworn allegiance to Caesar, to Rome. He wouldn't be where he was if he hadn't done that. There was a point when he bent his knee and kneeled before Caesar, kissed that Roman scepter, and was recognized and accepted in the Roman cohort as, as, as a centurion a place of distinction, a place of authority, a place of rule. And so he comes in, but his character is unique. He's, he, he loves the Jewish people. And so, some theologians believe that he was probably a Samaritan who'd been drafted by the Romans because they did draft a lot of local people. But you know the Jews, they hated the Romans. The Samaritans, they were half Jewish, half Gentiles, all right? Now, for the Jew in this particular cultural time in history, there was nothing 
worse in reality in regard to uh, uh, civility in life, worse than a Gentile, an unbeliever, you know, the goyim, they're just, they're unclean. You don't let a Gentile in your home. You don't, you don't rub shoulders with the Gentiles. And, and even more so, the only person hated more than the Gentile would be the Samaritan, who was half Jewish and half, half Gentile. And they would reject them. But here was a guy whose character was so unique. There was such an element, I believe, of integrity about this man and genuineness about this man that these Jewish leaders, they love this guy. In fact, they go to Jesus on behalf of this man to say, hey, you, this guy's a man of character. He loves, the, he loves our God. He loves our people. He built the synagogue here. I mean, out of his own pocket, he paid to have this building built. And, you know, of course, their mindset is he is worthy. But l let me tell you, uh, in reality, uh, the centurion doesn't believe he's worthy. He understands some things that most people don't understand. In fact, he doesn't feel that Jesus is even worthy to come under his roof, which is that second element about this centurion I certainly don't want you to miss, is, is, is the request that he makes. And the way he makes that request when he says, well, you're going to have to help me out there today because go back to number two in the sub points. If you'd restart that next time, we won't do that. You're fired. <laughs> Somebody shoot him. Take him out back. No. Oh, I'm, I'm just kidding, okay? Chill out. Goodness gracious. Did your daddy beat you or something? <laughs> oh, that's even worse, wasn't it? <laughs> this guy, he, do number two, please. And hit the sub point for me. But the centurion comes and he makes his request and he says, Lord, you know, I'm not worthy. But he, and he starts talking about his servant. And his servant, the word that he uses, first of all, is the word pies. And it, it has to do with really a young child. Now, when Luke talks about it, he calls this servant child. He calls him doulos. And that's indicating a little bit more about it. not just was he young. It indicates the fact that he was probably born into slavery. All right. And born into slavery means that you're really not human. You're just kind of like the, the cattle, like the animals, like the dogs. And you're there, you're more, you know, in servitude to be a, 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 a tool than, than anything else. You're just there to kind of help. But in this particular case, this centurion obviously has some kind of high regard for this young boy that's in the family and he cares about him. He says he's lying in my house, paralyzed with fever, you know, and he's suffering great pain doesn't distinguish what this particular disease might have been, but the fact that he cared for him so much as a servant obviously sets him apart, not only from the Roman soldiers, but from the basic mindset of the culture at that time in regard to slaves. It was Aristotle who wrote, you know, the great philosopher. He said, there can be no friendship and no justice toward inanimate things, not toward a horse or an ox or a slave. Because master and slave are considered to have nothing in common. He went on to say, a slave is just a living tool, just, an, just a tool as, as an inanimate slave. The Roman law expert by the name of Gaius wrote this. He said, it is universally accepted that the master possesses the power of life and death over his slaves. Another writer during the time, Valero, Varro, he, he maintained the only difference between a, a slave and a beast and a cart you know, the only difference between that and the slave was that the slave talked. They were treated the same. There was another philosopher during the time called Cato the Elder, and he advised those who might have economic difficulties. When you're going through economic difficulties, you should go out, and he wrote, said, look over your livestock, find the sickly animals, and sell them. Get, you know, get rid of any hides or wool that you may have and, and then sell the, the, the animals that, the, that are blemished and you know, uh, the old wagons, the old tool, and, and be sure and get rid of your old and sickly slaves. That was the mindset during the time. No respect for human life, no, no understanding of it. But this centurion who's in Capernaum didn't have such inhumane ideas. He loves this servant, and that's really kind of the only insight that we get. The third aspect about this centurion was his humility. Now, he comes to the Lord Jesus, and he, you know, he says, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. Now, this certainly is a little insight into this man's character, because he's not like most men in our culture even today. Most of us have a, a feeling, uh, an attitude of, well, we deserve. Amen. You know, I deserve this. I deserve better. L look at all your TV commercials, your advertising. 
You know, they throw out the brand new Jaguar, the car, whatever it might be. You deserve this. You know, they put on the, 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 the different kind of luxurious items for sale and marketing. You know, I got hooked by that by a car salesman one time. You ever been there? I know some of you have never done that. You know, he shows me the low model and he shows me the top model. The one with everything on it. And he says, he doesn't use me. He, goes, he, goes, he knows my weak point. Your wife deserves this. That's a pretty good line, isn't it? You can use that as a salesman, okay? Your wife deserves this. Yes, she does. What do you deserve? If we got what we really deserved, and I know it's hard. Some of you may even say amen before I say it, and it but it's really hard for us to really believe this or not, you know. But we think we deserve the best. We think we deserve everything. We think somehow we just by merit, the fact that I'm an American, I deserve it. You know, we think it's within our rights to, de- to have, you know, whatever it might be. And he's, his attitude is, I don't deserve a thing. If we can't approach God that way, then we're not going to approach God. God resists the arrogant. God resists the proud. Because if we would ever really get our spiritual eyes open and believe what the Bible says, we will see that we are sinners and we have been scarred and tainted and marked with sin. And the fruit of that is the selfishness. I want what I want. James said every argument you have is because you don't get your way. You have an argument today with your spouse, with your church, because you didn't get what you wanted. I mean, this is the way we're born. We, we come into the world, the doctor spanks us across our little bear behind, and we yell, I! <laughs> and from there on, from I, it's mine. Mine. Go in the nursery, you don't believe me. Watch the kids. Want to be playing with something? He's all happy. And then someone says, oh, you're happy. You like, that's, that's mine. And he takes it and he says, mine. And goes, it's mine. I it first. And you, know, you go to work, you're 40 years old, you're still doing the same thing. <laughs> From the simplest little thing. Who took my coffee mug? <laughs> Who ate my sandwich? You yeah. know? I, I, don't, I just go get another job. I don't need you. I'll get another partner. I'll get another. It's just, it's just the culture. We, but we don't understand when it comes to a relationship with God. If I get what I deserve, I'm going to hell. Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So if I get what I deserve, I ain't getting heaven. I'm not going to receive a life eternal. It's going to be hell in reality. This guy, when he comes to Jesus, he comes with an attitude of humility. Lord, I am just not worthy. And and he knows the Jews and he knows the people. And he knows perhaps even in bringing Jesus under his roof, and the law would have been considered for Jesus to become unclean. He'd have to go do a bunch of ceremonial washings and stuff to become clean. But he's humble. I I don't deserve anything from you. But I've got somebody I care about. I got somebody I'm concerned with. And how often do we approach the Lord with such a wrong attitude about like that? Well, God, you know, you, you just do this on my behalf, and you do it, and you do it now. And when things don't turn out, we, we, don't, we don't blame our fallen sin nature, and we certainly don't blame the devil for it. It's always God's fault. God, why would you do this? Why would you let this happen? Why? We live in a sin-filled, sin-tainted world, and we are by nature sinful people. We need the grace of God. And we need to have the same humility when this centurion says, Lord, I am not worthy. I don't deserve anything for you, but I am appealing to you for mercy, and I am appealing to you for grace. And this moves the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is humility. The next point deals not only with the servant's centurion's humility, but his wisdom. I mean, Jesus you know, looks at him and he says, you know, I haven't seen this kind of faith in all Israel. What kind of faith? This guy says, hey, I believe in you, Lord, that you are Lord, so much Lord, that all you have to do is just say the word and my servant will be healed. In fact, twice in this situation, he makes a reference to, the, to Jesus as Lord. And that's more than courtesy, by the way. That's an understanding. This is what causes Jesus to marvel. As much as these rabbis might come and identify this guy as somebody who's worthy, Jesus looks into the heart of this man. 
And the thing about Jesus is, is that he is all grace and he is all mercy. And he sees into this heart and, and he, he looks at this man's life and he says, you know, there's something here about this man that is just in his, of course, as God, he's not marvel, but, but in his humanity, he marvels at this man's faith. And not only just because he felt unworthy, but I think what he caused him to marvel was when he said, you just say the word and my servant will be healed. Well, where's that come from? Well, he's already made the statement, Lord. He understood. I'm going to try to say this as simple as I can, but it is a powerful and a, and, and, and a glorious principle from the Word of God. It is, it's a divine principle. Because he understood that Jesus is Lord and really believed he's Lord, which means over all things, all right? He's sovereign Lord. That all he has to do is speak. That he has so much authority that when the words come out of his mouth, that's all that needs to happen. You don't have that kind of authority. I don't have that kind of authority. Now this centurion said, I have some limited authority, and he began to explain it. So he begins to, he gets to, he gives us this, 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 in this wisdom, we get this divine principle that, that he understands the, that the, the power of God is there because of, of, of who he is. That he's Lord. He's over all things. The Bible says that he created all things. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. The Bible tells us that all things are held together by his mighty authority and power. In other words, everything on the planet would come unraveled. We'd go spinning out into space in an instant if it wasn't for the power and the lordship of Jesus Christ. It's not math that holds everything together. It's not engineering. It's not science. It's God, God, God. Many people don't want to recognize that, but this man does. In fact, the Bible says in Romans chapter 1, we'll come to this time in our, our world where you know, men will not honor God as God, but they'll honor themselves as God. But he recognizes the lordship of Jesus. That's why, no matter how difficult my situation becomes, or how, how much I may not understand it or comprehend it, Jesus is still on the throne. And he's Lord, and I can come to him, but I have to come humbly before him. And I have to realize and believe that he is Lord, that he is over all things. Now, I can focus on my situations and my circumstances and my trials and sickness or whatever it might be in my life, and I'll be consumed by those things. Oh, there's no hope, there's no way, there's no, and it's just, it's confusing, it's chaotic. We wring ourselves, you know, mentally in anguish at sometimes. Instead of coming back and backing away from all that and saying, I know how things look, but Jesus is Lord. He's bigger than these things. He's bigger than this. He can move. He has all authority. That things change at his word. He just speaks it and things change. That's the way you were saved in that moment when there was no hope. You are bound for hell without Christ. You're living for yourself. You're living in your sin. And then something happens. The word of God comes and you're changed. And what you once were, you no longer are. That's a miracle. Yeah. And he says, Lord, you know, you just, and here's the word he uses, for I am a man under authority. Yeah. There's the divine principle. I'm a man under authority. I am under the authority. And because I'm under authority, he said, how do you explain? He says, I'm a centurion. You know, Rome's given me authority. I've been given men. Hey, when I tell one to go, he gets up and he goes. And if I tell another, come, bam, he gets up and he comes. I have slaves. When I say to my slave, do this, he does it. Now, this is where Jesus begins to marvel because he realizes this man understands his principle of authority. Romans says all authority really just comes from God. But in our selfishness and in our, our particular kind of wisdom, we want to be the authority. We don't want anybody telling us what to do. Right? It doesn't take us long to discover that. Whether it's children or teenagers or adults, no one's going to tell me what to do. Kids get in that place, well, I can't wait till I get out of here. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. Boy, you're dreaming. It's like the stupid kid that says, you know, when I get out of here, nobody's going to tell me what to do because I'm going to join the Marines. <laughs> Let me drive you down there. 
<laughs> I'll take you down and let's see how that works for you. Yeah. Nobody's going to, and you, and you live with that mindset and it's, it's, it's ridiculous. And I don't care what you do, how many things you run from, there's still authority. I mean, you may find yourself on a little island somewhere in the middle of the Pacific. Say, all right, I'm the only one here. I'm the king of the jungle and I'm much of a jungle. Hey, but I'm in charge until the first hurricane blows through. <laughs> blows away your little hut and messes up all your little coconut trees. It's just a little old puny you left. We've, we spend our whole life running from authority when God says, this is the pathway to blessing. If you can understand authority and that all authority comes from God, and you can line yourself up in a biblical way to that authority, guess what happens? So Centurion says, I have authority because I am, what's this word, under authority. I'm under. The, the Greek word is, is, is made up of two words. It's the word hupotasso. And it means to, to line up something underneath. I would click it, but you're going to pay attention back there. <laughs> It's, it's two words. The first word is the word hupo, and it means literally to come beneath something, under something. That You know, I, I get under the table. It's a hupo. It can be used in lots of different ways. The second part is another word. It's just conjunction of two words. It's the word tasso, which literally means to put something in order, all right, to arrange it in the way that it's supposed to be arranged. So what does it mean to be hupo tasso? It means I come under something so that I can be put in an orderly manner. I position myself underneath. The centurion says, I have positioned myself up under the Roman authorities, and guess what? From the flow of that being in the right place, I'm under authority. I have authority. So every time I as a man, you as a woman, as a young person, whoever you might be, line up, Within the authorities the scriptures give us, guess what? We have authority. All right? And you don't have authority until you do that. You may think you're the king of the castle, but you're not. All right? You may, I'm the, I'm the head of this house. You're gonna, if you're not in the authority of God, you just got words and hot air. You can say you're boss, you're chief, all you want to. You got nothing. You can threaten, you can malign, you can curse, you can coerce, you can hit. But you still don't have any authority. No right is what the word literally means. It's the Greek word exousia. You have a right. All right? What happens? When I gave my life to Jesus, I surrendered to his authority over my life. I came under the umbrella of the headship of the governance of Jesus Christ and his word for my life. And now he's given me authority. What kind of authority? Well, one, and remember this word authority in the Greek language is exousia, which means right and privilege. I have now the right to become a child of God. I surrendered to Jesus, and he's given me this privilege to become his child. That's the best of all, amen. The Bible says, to as many as believe to them, he gave the power to become the sons of God. And the word for power there is not like dynamite, dunamis word. It's that, that privilege. You surrender to Jesus, you, you receive this glorious privilege of becoming one of God's children. All right? Now, guess what? He also extends that authority to me over the devil. God has given me a domain called my family, my, my world around me, and I have authority in this world, so I'm supposed to be a good, we use the word stewardship a lot, right? Well, basically, stewardship is, is this authority word. In other words, I, I'm surrendering under the, you know, the, I'm just a manager, he's the owner, all right? I'm surrendering under the owner's authority as manager, and now I can manage my family. I can manage my finances. I can manage my career. I can manage my ministry according to the will of God and according to the word of God. I've been given authority. If the devil comes tromping across my yard, I can say, get out in the name of Jesus, and he has to move. Amen. The devil comes against my children, I can say, hands off, in the name of Jesus. He has to take hands off. All right? Some of you don't believe that, but that's a biblical fact. That's the authority that God's given you in Christ Jesus. All right? Now, I don't have dominion over the world. Jesus does, so I can't say, devil, get off the planet. Or I would. Amen. Trust me. Amen? And I'd put up a no trespassing sign in Jesus' name. But I do have authority, and you do have authority, and we could go on and on because there's about 15 sermons in this one sermon today. I mean, we could linger here a long, long time. But God has set up authority. And so you need to surrender authority. It's in our lives, it's in our jobs, it's in our homes, it's everywhere we go. It's in our schools, it's in, it's in law, it's everywhere we go. God has established authority. But in Romans 13, he says he does it for your protection. It's not for evil, it's for good. And so I surrender to authority. The only time I can not surrender to authority is when it violates the word of God. Like, Jane, like, like Peter and John, when they went to the temple and, and the Pharisees said, you can't preach in his name anymore, you got to shut up. They said, we can't help but preach the gospel. Should we obey man or God? We obey God. 
But at the same time, God says, submit to these authorities because they're there for your protection. In your home, as a young person, God's given you a parent for your protection. As a wife, God's given you a husband for your protection. As a man, you surrender the Lordship of Jesus Christ for your protection, for your family's protection. All right? But, I, but we have so many preachers today that are such lily-livered cowards. I hope you're watching on YouTube, preacher. Such cowards that they won't, they won't stop for a moment and say, wives, submit to your husbands. Well, that'll start a war, won't it? You, you know, after Paul wrote that, I can see all the women, all the feminists in, in, in Ephesus gathered on the outskirts of town waiting for Paul to come to town, saying, Paul hates women. <laughs> Down with Paul, stone Paul. No, God said, here, I'm going to provide for you protection. I'm going to provide for you blessing. I'm going to provide for you authority in your life so that where you are, you have great power on your life, in your life, in your family, in your world. You have, but you need to get out under the, under, under the spout where the flow comes out, and it's under authority. And so it's a blessing for you. Now, obviously, God wants the man to be under authority as well. All right? So you're really not even much of a man or a husband or a father if you're not under authority. So you as a man have to submit your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And what woman is there in this room today who doesn't want a husband who's full of Jesus, who's concerned about her, who respects her, who loves her, who nurtures her? That's God's plan. That's the way God wants it. So this is the wisdom that, that blows Jesus away. In fact, it so blew Jesus away. It's only about a chapter later when he looks at his own disciples and says... Oh, ye men of such little faith. They didn't understand who Jesus was. Because my faith and your faith really rest upon the Lordship of Christ, does it not? The sovereignty of God. Because if your faith just rests on you, and this is where a lot of people get into the healing thing, where you didn't have enough faith. It, no. It had nothing to do with your faith. Ultimately, it has to do with your understanding of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And when you realize that, you realize that God is sovereign and sometimes he may heal, sometimes he may not heal. Sometimes he may take home, sometimes he may just give grace. Sometimes he might use a doctor because he wants you to tell the doctor about Jesus. Amen. So I would get after it so you don't have to keep going back. <laughs> Unless another specialist needs to hear about Jesus. The idea is, this is what Mar Jesus is marveling over this idea. And again, I have one, two, three, four, five, six pages just on authority, which we're not even going to get into. But let me just say this one verse, and we'll close with this. And I'm going to read it from the Amplified Bible, where it talks about, let every soul be subject to the higher powers. And I'll just read it with the Greek words. I'll put it this way. Let every soul be subject, hupotasso, come underneath, to the higher powers. Higher powers here is the word authority, exousia. For there is no power, there's no authority, no exousia, but what God gives. In fact, Jeremiah says that well, any time God decides to pluck up a nation, he'll pluck it up. The nations are a drop in the bucket. God's in charge is what he was saying. So that we are, he said, but, but all authorities of God and the authority, the exousia, the powers that be are ordained. That's the word just tasso. God put them in order. God set these authorities in order. So whoever resists, opposes the power, resists the ordinance, resists the arrangement of God, and they that resist shall receive themselves damnation. In other words, it's nothing but trouble if you just want to choose to live your selfish life and reject the authority of God on your life. The centurion's faith is the last point of really all this. And the basis of the centurion's faith was is that, you know, that Jesus is marveling because this guy understands the principles of the lordship of Jesus Christ and the Godhead, the authority of God. And he says, you know, then... Your servant's healed, and the Bible says it's in that moment. And he's marveling over the fact that this man's faith was so great. I, I, I think the question would be for us, just how great is our faith can be represented by how much humility we have towards the authority of Jesus in our life. And some of us really treat the authority of Jesus and, and the Word of God like it's an optional thing. You know, which is kind of like, well, I, I know what God wants, but I'm not going to do that. Hold on. You know what God wants, but you're just not going to do it. And you think that's okay? It's all right. Hey, you better wake up and smell the roses. They're quickly wilting over you. And this is when Jesus gets into this whole demonstration where he says something now in the story, and I'll wrap this up. I'll, I'll use that line from Neil Jeffries, and he goes on for 30 more minutes. Just a minute longer. Those men over there. Yeah. 
I think Neil preached at least an hour every time, didn't he? Just one more thing, one more thing. God, I know we got two, I'm out of time, but... <laughs> Jesus said this, and this is what blew the scribes and the Pharisees that were there away. I tell you that there will be kept com coming from the east and from the west who will sit down at my table and banquet with me. Now the Jews believe, if you go back and look at the Apocrypha and some of the books in Baruch and some of that, that only... Only Jews are going to sit down at that feast with the Lord. And, and, and that, that particular book talks about how that they'll, they'll feast on Levithon and uh, the mammoth, elephants and whales and all kinds. Basically, in other words, there's going to be so much food there that nobody will ever have any needs. And Jesus said, but the sons of the kingdom, many of the sons of the kingdom will not sit at that table. They're going to be cast out with weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus turned to those scribes and Pharisees and said, the Jews are not the only ones that are going to be saved as a result of me being here. Many Gentiles are going to be saved. The Apostle Paul was raised up later as the, as the apostle to the Gentiles. Jesus had to teach this lesson to Peter in that vision where the unclean animals were unfolded. The Gentiles are going to be brought into the kingdom. But there's going to be a lot of people who think that they're going to be at that banquet because of their genealogy, because of their lineage, that are not going to be there. And I'm sure there's someone... <gasps> Just as much as some people, when I say, just because you're a Baptist or Catholic or Methodist doesn't mean you're going to be in heaven. In fact, Amen. that only fits you for hell. Yeah. Because if you don't have faith in Jesus Christ, and if your commitment is not to Jesus Christ, and there's no surrender to Him as the head of your life, your heart, and your home, then you're going to be out there in weeping and wailing of gnashing of teeth, thinking just because you went to church or because you got sprinkled or you were confirmed or you were baptized that you're going to be in the kingdom. And he said, that's not the way it is. This man basically said, understands. There has to be yielding to the authority of God. He gets it. He gets it. Do you? Every one of us, folks, this isn't new news if you've been around Believer's Fellowship at all. Every one of us, at one point in time, are going to draw our last breath. Boom, and we're gone. I've sat by the bedsides of some great, great people when they passed. Every one of us in this house have somehow at one time or another been touched by death of loved ones, people we care about. Everybody's going to die. It's the nature of sin at work in the world in which we live, but Jesus is going to deal with that soon enough. But for those who have submitted and understood that we're just, the only way we can approach God is humbly in the confession of His Lordship over our lives. For those of us who've done that, when we draw that last breath on this side of the veil, in an instant, we're drawing our cleanest breath of air we've ever drawn if we step into the presence of God. Oh, yeah. The Bible says this way, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of a saint. In other words, you know, we look at death, oh, I can't believe that God wants to to me. God, why'd you do this? And God says, this is the way I, and the only way outside the rapture that they're going to be in my presence. Think of that one you love the most that you've lost, that loved Jesus God loved them far more than you could ever imagine and far more than you or I can love them as much as we may love them. And I can guarantee you in that moment when they step in the presence of Jesus, there is no retreat from that moment in their mind. Oh, they're not saying, oh, this is nice, but I'd rather go back. <laughs> this is nice, but excuse me. I'm No. Close that door behind me. And God, in that moment, is thrilled, precious in His sight. I don't know how it is with you, you know, when, something's, when I hold one of my granddaughters, that's just that's great. You know, I love being a parent, but this grandfather thing is great. Amen? It's good stuff. I just, you know, I, I was watching some of you grandparents just grin from ear to ear, looking at those grandbabies and moms. And, it's precious in your sight. How is it when we step in the presence of God, how much more precious to Him? Because that's why Jesus died, so we can be there. Amen. It's precious in His sight. Amen. But how horrible it is for those who do not know Him and have not surrendered their hearts to Him. Those Jews were devout, and they believed in God, but they hadn't believed on God. 
They had the information in their heads, but many of them didn't have the transformation of their hearts. They had religion, but no relationship. And this is what Jesus was driving home the whole time. How do I know it's not religion and a relationship? It gets pretty clear by what the centurion says. I'm under authority. Because when I come under the umbrella of Jesus' authority, things change in my life. I'm not the ruler of my own heart anymore. I've turned, so to say, the driving over to Jesus. I've given him the steering wheel. I've given him the brakes. I've given him the accelerator. Stop and go is his call now. Right turn, left turn, it's his call now. That's the way we know. Are we perfect? No, because there's a lot of times I try to grab the wheel back and I have a wreck. Amen? Amen. And sometimes it hurts. But I know, praise God for the grace of Jesus, that I can come to him and find healing. I can find grace. Where's your life? Where's your heart? Where's your faith? If you have faith, and you, like, like this centurion, have come to the place of humility and said, you speak the words. Your words is what I'm going by. Can you do that today? Would you stand with your heads bowed? Because I believe with all my heart that there's folks in this room today. Who